Early detection is the key as many forms of thyroid cancer are highly treatable. Alhamdulillah, especially when caught in the early stages. However, understanding the risk factors, symptoms and treatment options is crucial for effective management and recovery. Dr. Fatima Hussein joins us again in studio to further unpack this. Assalamu alaikum, doctor. Welcome. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, Jazakallah, for having me so much, uh, for having me here again tonight. It's an absolute pleasure to be here with you both tonight. Shukran for being with us. So I, I'm excited at least there's with with all these conversations at least there's hope so early detection uh, should be the focus of our discussion but really unpacking what thyroid cancer might mean so before we talk about thyroid cancer please uh, tell us what exactly is a thyroid uh where is it located i know Khalid um mentioned it earlier but what function does it play in the human body that we should be even thinking about it so the thyroid gland, um, first of all, it, it is a gland. It um, it produces hormones. Um, so it's part of one's endocrine system. So, um, you know, you have a neurological system that sends out messages on nerves. This is a system that sends out messages using um, hormones, essentially little um, uh, um uh, I would say substances within the blood, so they don't act. Usually, they don't act as fast as the neurological system, but they often work with the neurological system and they enhance the two. So, where is this gland situated? Um, it's situated in the front of the neck, um, just you know where the Adam's apple is. Every, when you see a boy with an Adam's apple, mm. it kind of sits just below there, and it looks like a butterfly. So, it has these two little wings on either side and a little thin bit that connects the two uh, wings of the butterfly the they so the one the wing on the left is called the left lobe the wing on the right is the right lobe and a little bit that connects the two is uh, that lies over the breathing pipe or the trachea that's called the isthmus and um, it's very small you shouldn't actually feel it within the neck um, other glands that people may know about uh, for example the pancreas is also a, like a, a, a gland or the adrenal gland that produces adrenaline so those are just other glands um, that have a similar kind of function but not exactly the same um, and the main function of thyroid is I like to tell people it's the keep everything just right hormone um, so it doesn't really uh, if it, there's too much of it, it makes you feel like you've had like way too much coffee uh, or way too much caffeine like a, or a lot of uh, Red Bulls. So overstimulated palpitations, sweating, you can't tolerate the heat, um, you lose a lot of weight, appetite um, a loss. If you have too little, you, everything slows down like super slow. So you become tired and fatigued, your hair becomes dry, your skin becomes dry, appetite increases, um, uh, your heart rate slows down, you can become edematous, like build up fluid in your body. So it's a... Uh, keep everything just right hormone you want it just right so that everything functions optimally you know uh, speaking of functioning you know uh, what are some of the symptoms obviously or signs should i say that will suggest that one's thyroid is not functioning properly so like i said if you if it's over so a thyroid overfunctioning, we call it hyperthyroidism, mm. and thyroid underfunctioning is hypothyroidism. So, um, overfunctioning, it feels like you've got too much caffeine on board, too it's too overactive. You've got those sweating, um, you can't sleep, all of those things. Symptoms, everything is overactive. You in hyperdrive, whereas hypothyroidism, underactive thyroid, everything slows down, super slow, weight gain constipation, hair loss, dry hair, dry everything, um, tiredness, you can't sleep enough, cold, you, you, the cold is too cold, always wearing lots of clothes. Those are just a little bit of the signs of o over or under functioning. Mm. But when it comes to thyroid cancer, um, usually the vast majority of people are actually in the euthyroid, which is meaning they've the thyroid function is actually normal. Mm. It's not over or under functioning. 
you know you're talking about the, now the the different types of uh thyroid of course so uh it's over functioning or it's under functioning so should one uh, should one have one's thyroid level check regularly or at any specific age or something like neither no um so we don't check thyroids um it's there's no specific screening for them mm. um like how there is for breast cancer or like how we discussed last week for cervix cancer mm. or for males for prostate there's n- there's no screening for them um in families where they have thyroid cancer cancers those are families where we may screen for thyroid cancers specifically mm. but otherwise it's usually on a symptom basis So mm-hmm. if a patient presents with certain symptoms over under functioning or um uh specific symptoms of a thyroid cancer then it may indicate that you would want to test the patient's blood levels to see if if, if that is perhaps the case. Interesting I think that sometimes when when you learn about something new that's within your body um I think that would be the obvious question do I need a checkup um at what point do i need the checkup because dry hair okay i get too cold or extremely cold but is that enough for me to assume that um which i i think because uh, i would think that if i have a few of those symptoms i would want to and it seems like that might be the case i would go check for it so it usually come these symptoms occur in a cluster i would say um you it's not like uh you know like side effects like mm. uh for example if you take a medication you may or may not get a side effect these symptoms usually go with the disease and the more uh long standing the disease is um the more of the symptoms one will get so i would say if you just have dry hair it's probably not hypothyroidism mm. maybe you live in joburg um <laughs> <laughs> what are you saying dr fatima <laughs> um, yeah, you know what i'm trying to say maybe you're using the wrong shampoo maybe there's a dermatological problem mm. um but i mean if you've got thyroid uh, if you've got dry hair you've got dry skin you've got the weight gain you've got the constipation you're constantly tired um you're constantly fatigued you're starting to get swollen ankles this may be something that you may want to have a chat with your doctor about because mm-hmm. then you're starting to have a lot of these symptoms that may indicate that we should get tested can medications uh stress lifestyle factors contribute to the thyroid functioning in a different way um so always yes <laughs> so yes stress um um can lead to autoimmune diseases so autoimmune disease is basically when a when your own body starts to to recognize itself as abnormal and and, <laughs> and raise an immune reaction against itself um when it comes to the thyroid there's two very common ones that we know about um with the overfunctioning um thyroid that's graves disease um and underfunctioning ones usually often Hashimoto's um thyroiditis um and stress can is associated with it so is smoking um so uh various lifestyle factors it's mostly that we don't know why uh these 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 diseases are associated with it but we do know that they do play a role in the development of these autoimmune uh disorders So definitely obesity like I said also plays a role smoking exposure to radiation all increase the risk of developing thyroid related diseases. Mm. Um and being underweight could that also in one way or another because oftentimes I know doctors emphasize on obesity mm-hmm. and being underweight might seem like okay at least I'm on the good level but I'm not really. So we like people to be just right. Goldie locks. Um uh underweight is it's not good for its own for own group of reasons. Um I'm not going to say that uh that is what everybody should aim for, you know. Um anorexia is, has it and bulimia have their own problems. Mm. Um so I think living a good health uh, a good healthy lifestyle as much as possible, um exercising um and avoiding um toxins uh, taking in toxins smoking 
those sort of things. Those are all moving in the right direction um, and keeping your body, body healthy. I think the the obesity is is a epidemic. We're starting to see it associated with lots of different types of cancers. Um, and I, it's, it's as much about the weight um, and the toxins that that um, the body builds up when you are that kind of when you are that weight um, as much as it, it it requires you to take in a lot of unhealthy foods and have a very unhealthy lifestyle um, to get to that weight that predisposes you to disease as well so it's may may as well be cause and effect um, that lead obesity in itself to to be a, a cause of a problem. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Uh, speaking about obesity contributing to many of the diseases, um, many of the cancers, let's talk about thyroid cancer and, and how prominent is thyroid cancer in South Africa? Um, are there various types of thyroid cancers and what should we look out for? So there's lots of different types of thyroid cancers. We're not very good, I must say, as South Africans in doing a lot of research. Um, so the data is pretty old um, as to the numbers. Um, but uh, data suggests that one in about one in a half, 1,500 males will develop breast can- um, thyroid cancer, excuse me, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and one in about um, 300 females will develop thyroid cancer. So it's much, 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 much more common um, amongst women uh, than in males. So about nine times more, nine to ten times more common in females than in males. So. Um, definitely a female predominance there. Um, and the different types, the most common one that we have in South Africa is papillary thyroid cancer, um, then followed f- um, by follicular thyroid cancer. Those are the most common, well-differentiated thyroid cancers. They have a very good prognosis and they actually originate from the thyroid tissue itself. Um, there are other thyroid cancers, medullary thyroid cancer, very strong genetic um, predisposition. And it originates actually from the C cells that are within the thyroid. So n- they are found within the sy- thyroid, but they're not, I, we can't say that they are originally thyroid tissue. So they have a very different function to the thyroid tissue itself this is what makes endocrine so interesting it's so it's absolutely absolutely fascinating um and then of course there's the very poorly differentiated thyroid cancers um like anaplastic thyroid cancers and then lots of diseases metastasize to the thyroid so things like lymphoma um, um, squamous cell carcinomas you can find within the thyroid we've had a breast cancer in the thyroid as well um so yeah, get lots of different different diseases affecting the thyroid. So, um, speaking obviously about the different types of uh, thyroid cancers that you will find, there are obviously causes as to why you will get those different types of uh, thyroid cancers. So, what are the most common causes, uh, the, and how does it typically affect you know someone who is who, who seemingly gets those kinds of cancers? So gender um, is a thyroid cancer is uh, again more common in females than it is in males. Mm. Um, and, and you asked me to to start about the most common ones. Mm. Um, radiation exposure. We whenever you have a patient with thyroid cancer, you're gonna you're gonna ask about that. Genetics. Say if any family, if they've got a family history of thyroid cancer, specifically medullary thyroid cancer. Um, very uh, at least one in every three people will have a family with medullary thyroid cancer will have a family history or will have a genetic um, association um, with a medullary thyroid cancer so that's is i mean it's if you have three people with medullary thyroid cancer one of those people has a genetic mutation that's causing them to develop it very strong genetic association there with that type of cancer um iodine deficiency especially with the follicular thyroid cancers um we see that's why we see a lot more follicular thyroid cancers in um the eastern cape population mm. it's uh, um they still eat um iodine deficient salt or they still have most of our salt in South Africa, I don't know if people know, is actually fortified with iodine. That's why you see on the packet, iodinated salt. 
Mm. Um, it's actually to increase our iodine intake. Mm. Not that people should be taking in like large amounts of iodine. Um, it's a trace element. It, sh- it should be taken everything in moderation. <laughs> um, but a deficiency in iodine can result in the development of a goiter. Long-standing goiters, as we often see in the Eastern Cape population again. Um, so they have these big masses in their neck. So if you if it's been there for a long time, they can undergo malignant transformation as well. Mm. Yeah. So is... Uh, and then, of course, smoking and obesity, as we all know. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> you know, when you mentioned the smoking, but uh, I always like people you know, who mention the the disadvantages of smoking. <laughs> in this month. People who discourage smoking at mm. all costs are my favorite kinds of people. So is anyone more predisposed to developing thyroid issues? Yeah, woman. Easy answer, woman. Woman, woman um, over the age of 40, so it's more common in your middle-aged group, a, aged females. Older, the older you get, the more likely you are to develop um, a thyroid cancer. Um, people from specific age groups, so usually we say the... Um, um, this is a disease that tends to affect um, people from a poorer or more disadvantaged communities. Um, so that, because again, the iodine deficiency, the uh, poor access to um, health care, etc. And then, of course, um, things like uh, obese people mm. were more likely. So if you have, I, I don't know how to put this nicely, if you have a, a large lady mm. who is middle-aged, mm. she's very like, she, she is the ideal person to get thyroid cancer. Come on, you're a doctor, just say it. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no one will judge you, you know, because you're a doctor, you've got all the credentials. So uh, you've got all the right to mention all those people because... Uh, Someone, a, a man at home now listening to you will be jumping, you know, up and down in excitement uh, because you have mentioned that women, you know, uh, can be sort of like predisposed to developing the thyroid issues. Wow. So besides women, who else is at risk of getting affected by the thyroid cancer? So people, um, the, you remember the Chernobyl disaster? Everyone heard about Chernobyl. There's been like a whole lot of... Um, uh, documentaries about it. So uh, we see people with radiation exposure. Um, that's one of the reasons why people who do radiography, the x-ray ladies, um, if you ever go for x-rays, they often wear a little thing to protect their thyroids. Um, because radiation exposure also plays an important role. Exposure to things like drugs like lithium um, and um, uh, um uh, certain toxins that are related to rubber and um, the the um, paint industry can increase your risk of developing thyroid cancer as well. Uh, those people are more at risk. We, we would check. So how important is early detection, you know, in treating thyroid cancer? And when, what can people do to reduce their risk? Liver... Live a healthy lifestyle, I think, is very important. Healthy diet. This is one cancer where you want to eat your green vegetables because it does provide you with a natural source of iodine. Mm. Um, and if you don't like green vegetables, then salt, but your physician may not like that because too much salt causes hypertension. Mm. It brings mm. you back down to um, uh, everything in moderation. Um, so exercise, try to avoid obesity, can't avoid being female. If you have a genetic risk, if you have got a, um, a long-standing family, uh, lots of family members with thyroid-related diseases, it's something that you should talk to your your um, general practitioner about so that they can maybe look into it and get you, uh, see if it's, re- if it's relevant to get test, get you tested or maybe even just at least examine your thyroid to see if there's something, any lumps or bumps um, in that uh in that area um thyroid how important is it to to for early diagnosis it's always great to diagnose a disease early Mm. and thyroid cancer specifically is one of those diseases where if you diagnose it early enough um patients you don't um you have like i said those two lobes of the thyroid um then 
one can just remove the one lobe of the thyroid. Um, you won't necessarily need to remove the whole thyroid. Mm. You'll need um, treatment after that necessarily, not necessarily like um, treatment after that comes in the form of radioactive iodine. We can talk about that later. Um, but you won't necessarily need that. Um, and you can just be followed up um, for a couple of years. Or you can just say your treatment is almost complete just with something <coughs> that small, just removing that one lobe of the thyroid. It's amazing. Well, early detection is the key to this conversation. And if you think you have some of those symptoms, do speak to your general uh, GP. Get it checked out. Uh, a listener asking what is myxedema and wanting to know at which point is the thyroidectomy indicated? So uh, myxedema is um, what I told you about, that swelling of the the legs, so where you have that buildup of the fluid. Um, so it, it, the legs, the limbs become very, very swollen and, um, and the skin becomes thickened and changed. It's usually, um, we, we look, you see that symptom as at a late stage of long standing hypothyroidism or under functioning thyroid. Um, this myxedema is, is not generally treated with thyroidectomy. Um, I, I can't see a specific indication where we would treat myxedema with a thyroidectomy. We would in general treat myxedema by treating its underlying cause, which is hypothyroidism. So we'd give the patient thyroid hormone or altroxin to um, or euthyrox, uh, maybe people are more acquainted with that uh, medication, to increase their thyroid hormone levels. Um, and that will generally uh, treat the underlying issue and um, help treat the myxedema. Inshallah. I mean, I mean, because <laughs> I mean. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get a visual image of what these legs would look like. I've seen, especially with women who have like really uh, swollen legs, mm. um, and I'm never too sure. Is it like, uh, is it swollen because they've been walking too long? But it stays. That it makes it swollen. Too much. It looks like that. Yeah, I see the picture in your head. Mm. That's what it looks yes. like. <laughs> That's the picture that came to my mind. Um, but are they? Seen how much work in South Africa are we doing in relation to thyroid cancer um, and just understanding the thyroid gland and how important it is in our body? And then with that work, how are we doing with maybe uh, debunking the misconceptions that come with understanding thyroid cancer? So uh, given the amount of people who don't know where their thyroid is, or what a thyroid is, or what a thyroid does. Mm. Um, I'm going to say not much, or maybe we're not addressing the correct channels, um, or maybe people find thyroid a bit complicated. Um, so, and I, I, so I don't think overall enough work is being done um, about uh, about thyroid. And in, I want to think. I like thyroids a lot, so I think it's under it's a very understated gland, uh, mm. given the importance of um, of what it does and and how it maintains metabolism and the body and the important role that that it has in in um, in function. We tend to believe that it it has a, a lot to do with um, just weight gain and weight loss, and mm. um, but it's not just that. Uh, it does play important roles in those things but what we don't realize is that if you don't have enough thyroid hormone um, during pregnancy your kid can actually the child that you are pregnant with can actually be born with a neurological deficit so um, uh, the you know you know that word cretin have you ever heard about cretins mm -hmm. like you're such a cretin Okay, no, never mind. Uh, it, 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 it almost sounds like a gremlin. Yeah, something similar. Yeah. Um, but it, it actually is is a term that is used to describe babies that are born as a, who have severe neurological deficit as a result of being exposed to um, insufficient amounts of thyroid during, uh, during pregnancy. Um, so it's a very, very important hormone throughout um, throughout one's life. Um, it does play a very important role in in your bone 
your cardiac function, your neurological function, your metabolism, bowel function, um, muscle function, all of those. It's it's the keep everything just right hormone. Is are we able to do a general hormone test just to see if uh you know because there are also conversations around hormone imbalances and so on so i'm trying to put that all together especially with the thyroid gland being this the one that keeps everything together so then how do we bring that all together how do how do you know if you have enough hormones for example because if you don't have enough of them, then you have symptoms. Mm. Um, then you have you develop issues that are related to the deficiency of that specific hormone. For example, growth hormone. If you have too much of it, you ha- develop a disease called acromegaly, where you start developing these big hands and big, um, uh, a very big nose. They very prominent for it. These things come with the specific um, symptom complexes and and a group of um, of features that make us suspicious for an underlying disease. Um, uh, it's very easy to test for, for um, specifically for thyroid um, hormone, your thyroid hormone levels. It's a blood test. The thing is, it's also not the right thing just to go and test everybody because um, specifically in thyroid, you will pick up a lot of patients who have slightly low, uh, what we call subclinical hyperthyroidism, or subclinical hypothyroidism. So they may have a, a biochemical or on the blood test slightly abnormal levels, but physiologically, so looking at their bodies, they are completely asymptomatic. And then the question arises of whether you should be treating those patients with um, with the, 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 the medications um, if they don't have any symptoms? And the answer is no. Um, you treat patients. We don't necessarily treat numbers. And therefore, your test should be directed by the symptoms that the patient is presenting with. Mm. So again, we're going to go, I'm going to take a step back and say, if you have symptoms, a group of symptoms, not necessarily just one or two, um, go to your doctor, chat to them about it. And you can always chat to your doctor about the value of doing a specific test. These tests are not without cost implication. Um, And then if they think that you have the complex um, and that it is useful to do the test, then they will most certainly probably recommend doing the test and then take it further in terms of treatment if there is a abnormality found. So now we uh, we have the symptoms, we come and see you, um, we do some tests. What happens after we do these tests in terms of diagnos- um, diagnosis? The doctor will review the blood test results and see if there is any abnormality in terms of the, the result. If it's an over-functioning thyroid, um, there's treatment that can be given for that. If it's an underfunctioning thyroid, we'll give you thyroid hormone that comes usually in the form of a medication. Um, excuse me, <coughs> either altroxin or euthyrox. Um, there's different dosages. We usually start low. We slowly increase the amount of the medication that we give until we see that your hormone level has responded um, uh, uh, and is within the normal range. And um, people want a quick fix when it comes to. Uh, to thyroid, um, thyroid, uh, when when it comes to anything, um, but that's not the way your thyroid works. So, <clears throat> the interval at which you'll you'll give the medication is about a month or two. Um, see how the patient responds. I mean, do a repeat blood test at that at that point. So we won't do just increase the check you every week. Check mm. the blood test. It takes. It takes weeks, three to six weeks, for to see if the, the thyroid hormone has actually responded appropriately. So it's not something if you your doctor is giving you follow ups every six weeks. It's not being lazy. She's actually she him or she is is uh, doing the right thing um, because they they following you up at appropriate intervals where it's most useful to do the tests. And then, of course, um, over-functioning ones, we can give you some radioactive iodine to ablate the over-functioning area of the thyroid. It's not as bad as it sounds. It's a, just a little tablet um, uh, with a little bit of radioactivity attached to it. It's, it doesn't have as many side effects. <laughs> You're looking at me like it's going, 
been so awful. You were and speaking about the radiation earlier on, so I'm just trying to understand. <clears throat> it's it's a very different form of radiation mm. to even the type of radiation that we give for for cancer uh, for uh, for cancers like um, cervix or breast cancers or um, the diff- the type of radiation we know, like the X-rays. This is a different form of radiation. Okay. So oh, what what type of treatment options are available? I know a mother somewhere in Cape Town will be listening to all of these diagnoses and the types of uh, cancers and the treat- and the sort of symptoms you made mention of and they'll be thinking about Panato or something like that. You know, in Cape Town we've got something everything we want to give it a panada <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> so, is a good drug yeah so what kind of a treatment options are available for people diagnosed with this thyroid cancer uh, doc before you <coughs> answer that question just to add to what Khalid is asking um you mentioned cost effective so mm-hmm. when we are talking about a treatment and testing and so on in terms of money what are we looking at well i want to say um thyroid is if you have to look at the amount of money we spend overall in the treatment of um, the more common cancers, like for example, breast cancer, I'm going to say thyroid cancer is actually a very cheap cancer to treat. <coughs> um, <coughs> um, because its treatment is not, um, it comes in the form of, of radioactive iodine, um, specifically for, for thyroid cancer, and that's only if there is quite um, if there is advanced disease mm. so not everybody with thyroid cancer will get radioactive iodine like I said earlier if you can pick it up early enough you can just be treated with surgery and you will not necessarily require any further treatment mm. you get to keep half the other half of your thyroid and that will produce thyroid hormone and only one out of eight people who get a, a, a hemithyroidectomy or a, a lobectomy where only one part of the thyroid is removed will actually really require thyroid hormone supplementation. So that's amazing. <clears throat> For the people with more advanced disease, um, they get radioactive iodine. And the worst part of radioactive iodine is that you get to sit alone in a room mm. for about three or four days until the radioactivity is low enough to be safe to be around other people. Um, it's quite a cute drug uh, mm. in that the thyroid likes iodine. It uses iodine to make thyroid um, thyroid hormone. So when when it when we give radioactive iodine, we're actually giving iodine that has a little um, colloid of radioactivity at the back of it. So the thyroid, if there is any residual thyroid cancer or even metastases in the case of thyroid cancer. Mm. It takes up this iodine molecule, and it, that um, cancer cell is destroyed by that iodine and that radioactivity that's attached to it, which is very different to other very toxic drugs like chemotherapy and um, the other therapies that you get in most other cancers treatment. So that's what makes re- treatment treating thyroid cancer so nice because it's actually not unpleasant. So for, for someone who perhaps may have l- been listening, you know, to the show from the start of the show, you made mention of our salt, you know, um, and iodine is being put there. So someone will say, saying that thyroid's like iodine, uh, can someone eat salt or something like that as part of the the treatment? No, 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 no. Uh, I think the way the radio the radioactive iodine is not like salt mm. with iodine in it um, because salt with iodine is just salt with iodine. Mm. Radioactive iodine is specifically an iodine molecule with radioactivity attached and it's that radioactivity that destroys the cancer cell. Okay. <clears throat> wow. So how does thyroid cancer affect a person's quality of life during and after treatment because you know you when you treat some of th- some other things you know your chemotherapy is some some people do have those side effects you know uh, the after effects but when it comes to thyroid cancer is it any different very different um i have to say if i look at the quality of life 
of the patients that I treat with breast cancer mm. and the patients that I treat with thyroid cancer, it's vastly different. Um, definitely the more uh, well-known cancers, like the, the more common, <clears throat> thyroid cancer is fundamentally treated differently or at least the well-differentiated thyroid cancers are treated differently um, to the conventional cancers that we think about. So you actually have to change how you think about cancer when you start thinking about thyroid cancer specifically because the treatment is actually not unpleasant at all. It, um, Like I said, the worst part of it is actually the fact that you are radio radioactive, literally in inverted commas, yeah. for a short period of time after you've give, been given that um, capsule to take. For the rest of it, after those four days, you're free as a bird. Um, you go into your, nobody even knows yet you had thyroid cancer. You end up with a little scar as a result of the operation. Um, but apart from that, um, there isn't really any marks that you have or any long lasting um, side effects of treatment or major deficits in terms of quality of life that one can one, that one often experiences. How would you advise uh, the uh, quote unquote poor communities who find who struggle with this um, because I, because of the resources that they don't have, how do they then go about maybe changing their lives in such a way that they can live healthier? How do we go about that? It's very difficult for the poorer communities um, because of their access to resources. Um, so it comes down to finances. Um, and the fact of the matter is they, they're just not financially able um, to have access um, to the fortified foods and to a large variety of fresh, healthy fruit and vegetables. Um, and um, the different, the you know, the different components of a healthy diet. Yes, they're getting in a lot of exercise because I mean, they just simply don't have a car and they have to walk those long distances. But on the same, um, the flip side of that coin is that getting access to a healthcare facility may also be a very long distance away. It mm -hmm. may not be the priority for that person to spend their finances on, especially if all they have is a lump in the neck mm -hmm. and it's not causing any symptoms. Mm -hmm. The the listeners asking if you <clears throat> could maybe just repeat what you said with regards to um, when th uh, does the test indicate the thyroid function? So it was the listener that asked about the myxedema and the other medical term. Um, so if you have myxedema, it is usually the the term myxedema is associated with hypothyroidism. It's a late symptom um, of hypothyroidism. The hypothyroidism will be picked up on a blood test. So your doctor should probably, or I would suggest that you have a blood test, um, a thyroid function test that will look at something called your TSH, your T4 and T3. Um, that's what we call a thyroid profile. Um, and that combination will see if you do indeed have hypothyroidism. And if you do have, that is the biochemistry behind it, if you do have a biochemical diagnosis of hypothyroidism, then your doctor will usually start you on um, thyroid hormone supplementation, which comes in the form of altroxin or euthyrox. They'll start you on a, on a well, if you have myxedema, they probably will start you on a slightly higher dose, so maybe about 50 micrograms of altroxin or euthyrox. Then they will treat you, bring you back maybe in about six weeks' time, repeat the blood test, and see if your TSH is responding, meaning initially when you come, your TSH, if you have myxedema and hypothyroidism, your TSH will be very high. So on the repeat blood test, we're looking for an improvement in that and that amount, whatever it is, 37, maybe it will come down to like 20 or something like that. If you're looking for a decrease in that TSH, that will show that it, that, that your hormone level is responding. 
then the doctor may either choose to increase that dose of altroxin, maybe to 75 micrograms, bring you back in another six weeks, and check again at that point if your thyroid function is responding. See how it and how it's responding, and then so forth and so forth until it's in a normal thyroid hormone level. Mm. So uh, I know we spoke a lot about treatment, you know, the symptoms and so on, but can thyroid cancer be prevented? Yes and no. So certain <laughs> types of, uh, of thyroid cancer can be prevented. Mm. So um, in the case of modality thyroid cancer, mm. it's a, like I said, it is um, a third of those patients will have a genetic predisposition to develop modality thyroid cancer. Um, if we know that they have the genetic predisposition, um, we can, I mean, we can test the person who's present, uh, presenting. If they have kids or other family members, um, we can test the other family members mm. for that genetic abnormality. And then um, in so doing, we can do a prophylactic thyroidectomy if those patients have the genetic mutation um, so as to prevent them from getting um, thyroid cancer um, uh, in the long term. So I know um, when you have just been diagnosed uh, with an illness or something like that, especially if it includes the term cancer in the end, it can be quite stressful. So what sort of advice could you or would you give to someone who has just been diagnosed with that thyroid cancer? Depending, there's very few, actually this is the one cancer where I can say you can chill. Mm. <laughs> 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 it's um, take a chill pull and just relax. Um, the the most aggressive forms of thyroid cancer are the most rare of the thyroid cancers. They are ex those ones are really the, the extremely aggressive ones are also extremely rare, few and far between. So the most likely thing is that you're going to have a well-differentiated thyroid cancer, which mm. means that this cancer is extremely treatable. Model of the story, go to a good doctor who does a lot of thyroid operations and who does um, a lot of, who, who specializes in thyroid medicine and mm. make sure that you are treated well. Um, because nowadays we can actually treat you very conservatively so we can, we without compromising your long-term health, we can actually treat you with not a lot of surgery. We don't have to do as much as we used to do before. Mm. Um, but it would, re it, it does require a little bit of <laughs> expertise <laughs> in, the, in the field and, and more up-to-date uh, uh, knowledge. Also, the operation done by a proficient surgeon who does a lot of thyroid mm. surgeries mm. is actually... Um, not as dangerous as it used to be before where, you know, people used to become uh, come out whole so that uh, and have voice issues afterwards, breathing issues, all those things. It's not like that anymore. You just need a good, you need a good team on your hand, on your side, mm. and you really have a good outcome. Mm. Really good you outcome. You know, uh, as a doctor yourself, you know, uh, I've always wanted to ask this question because you've just made mention now that uh, you need a good doctor. For someone out there, how do you choose a good doctor? Yeah, you see that, that I, I I knew I put my foot in it. Um, I think doctors. I don't know many doctors mm. that w we actually were talking about it today, and I, I mentioned to my the oncologist that I work with. Mm. Doctors don't like making mistakes. Mm. Um, it's. It's not something that we we do not wish to harm someone's life. Yeah. When I'm talking about a good doctor, I'm talking about so they, we all have interests, uh. um, and yes, you do get the general of the general surgeons who yeah. does everything, and they they. But those are those. I'm going to say we are bec medicine is becoming more and more specialized, mm. or rather, more and more subspecialized. And you'll get people with specific interests in specific areas. So you, that's where you get the colorectal specialist and the specialist in liver surgery and the specialist in cardiac surgery. Mm. Um, so in this scenario, thyroid cancer on its own is not a common cancer. Yeah. So you want to go to a doctor who 
sees a lot of it and who does a lot of these operations uh-huh. um, and therefore has experience with the disease and experience with the surgery um, to to get the best outcome mm. and to have the least risk. Um, so so the punchline I'm looking for is that a good doctor is the one with the experience, you know. Uh, that, that I, I didn't want to say that with saying that, but ultimately, yes. But you must know... Experience doesn't come without um, uh, without the negative sides of it. Mm. There are there, there's a saying in surgery that you cut, you cry. So there isn't. Um, we are human. Mm. So doctors are humans after all, mm. and um, we 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 all are subject to. We want to do our best, but sometimes the best in certain scenarios is not. Everybody doesn't have the same outcome. Let's put it that way. There are complications, there are side effects, and one just needs to to put that also in the background. Well, as we heard, doctors are humans and really, really, really dislike to make mistakes and obviously want to give you the best outcome. And so do find someone who is a specialist, aka Dr. Fatima Hussein, if you do want to share contact details, or if there's anyone looking for um well, at least consultation or just trying to discuss and figure out what is going on or what is the way forward or could this be something that they need to look into. Perhaps we'll share that a bit later But Dr. Fatima Hussein. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. A listener saying, uh, sending her salams, your aunt. <laughs> Lots of love from her. And again, uh, shukran for being with us and speaking to us about one of your favorite topics. Oh, I, I thank you very much. It's really, uh, it is one of my favorite topics. I really do love thyroid disease. <laughs> Hence, you are the specialist. But until we chat again, Dr. Fatima, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.